So this morning, today's topic is um, going to be vertical spreads. Uh, the thing I really like about vertical spreads is, to me, they're kind of the building block into a lot of different option strategies. So we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, for those of you who took the overnight profit class and got the ultimate guide to verticals, that is a much more extensive class than what we'll be doing here. This will just be a quick dive into kind of what they are and what they're about. And of course, if you guys have any questions, please let me know and I will be happy to cover it. I'll try and keep an eye on them during the session there. Hey, Morris, Phil, great to see y'all in here. Good morning. And I, I miss saying good morning to anyone else. Good morning, guys. I hope you all are doing well. Um, and yes, we usually start at 930 Central, <laughs> 1030 Eastern in the training room. So let's go ahead and get started. So vertical spreads. Well, the first thing to know about vertical spreads is they consist of two strikes, one that is sold to open and one that is bought to open. Both strikes will be within the same expiration and a vertical spread can either consist of two calls or two puts, right? That's a standard vertical. Now there are two types of vertical spreads. There's a credit spread and a debit spread. So we'll talk about both of those. A debit vertical spread also known as a debit spread or maybe a long debit vertical, right? There are a few different names people can call them by. Um, but in general, a debit vertical spread is when the bot to open strike is closer to at the money or in the money compared to the sold to open strike. When the two are netted together within the same order ticket, it will create a net debit. So when you pull this up on your option chain, your option platform, and you're looking to open up a debit vertical spread, one of the ways that you know that you put your strikes correctly is that it typically, right, it should always end up making a net debit when you're opening both strikes within the same order ticket. The risk on a long debit vertical spread is the net debit paid to open the spread. Right, So whatever you pay to enter the trade, that is your ultimate risk on the trade uh, per contract. The reward or the profit potential is the difference between the spread width itself and the net debit. So let's say we jumped into a 10 point spread on SPX and we paid $3.60 for it. Then our risk right, is the debit that we paid. It's $3.60. That's our debit. The profit potential or the reward is the 10 point width of our spread minus the 360 debit. So in this case, our profit potential would be $6.40 per contract. So that's a debit vertical spread. A credit vertical spread is kind of the opposite. So a credit vertical spread is when the sold to open strike is closer to at the money or in the money compared to the bought to open strike. So much like a debit spread, is bought to open at or in the money, sold to open out. The opposite is true for a credit spread. You sell to open the strike closer to at or in the money, and you buy to open the other strike further out. When the two are netted together in the same order, it will create a net credit, right? The opposite of the vertical, uh, the debit spread. So the risk on the credit spread is kind of a similar way that you figure out the profit potential on a debit vertical spread. So the risk on a credit spread is the difference between the spread width and the net credit received when opening the trade. That's your risk. Your profit potential is actually the credit itself whenever you opened the trade to begin with. So whatever that net credit was total on the order ticket, that is actually your total profit potential on the trade. So as soon as you look at opening the trade, you know what your profit potential is. It's the risk that you end up having to determine or look at, right? Which can easily be done through your brokerage platform or, you know, it's always just good to know on hand that, for example, if I was looking at a five point spread and I received a decent credit of $3.20. Maybe I opened it slightly in the money because I really thought it was going to move out of the money, right? So I got a slightly better credit of $3.20. Well, if $5 is the spread and $3.20 is my profit potential, because that's the credit I received when I opened it, that means my risk on the trade is $1.80 because there's still part of that spread that's left out there that's technically not covered by the credit. And that ends up being our risk 
whenever we talk about credit vertical spreads. Also sometimes known as short vertical spreads or short credit spreads, right? All of those names mean the same thing. So of course I knew, you know, what's the difference then between credit spreads versus debit spreads? Um, well, debit spreads, starting off with them because that's what we went over first, it's a better debit entry when volatility is lower, right? Because typically the option strikes won't be as expensive as what we're experiencing now. So getting at the money or even slightly out of the money, right? You'll typically get a better debit. And in turn, with that lower risk, you're also ending up with a better profit potential. So that's the benefit one of a debit spread. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is the spread, you want the spread to be going in the money into expiration for the full profit potential. So you want both strikes to be in the money by that expiration to receive that max profit potential, which on a debit spread, once again, is the spread width minus the debit you paid. So on that 10 point spread that we talked about back here, where we had the 360 risk, 640 profit potential, we would want both of those strikes on SPX to be completely in the money at expiration to allow for that profit. That means if they're puts, we want the market to go down so they're in the money. If they're calls, we want the market to go up so they're in the money. And then, of course, debit spreads do great in a trending chart setup, right? If we're in a bearish trend, you're looking at put debit vertical spreads. If you're in a bullish trend, you're looking at usually call debit vertical spreads. So on the other end, credit spreads, right? So credit spreads are actually better to enter when volatility is higher. So you get a better credit entry when that volatility is rising, right? So for example, in the market that we're seeing now, right, when we had all that volatility, because that extrinsic value built into the option strikes in turn, that means that there's more premium out there. And that premium usually allows for a better credit. So you can go slightly out of the money and still have a pretty good risk versus reward. We're typically in a low volatility market. If you go out of the money, you're going to have a lot heavier risk versus that profit potential. This still doesn't mean you can't open credit spreads in lower volatility markets or debit spreads in higher volatility, but just a general rule of thumb, right? Debit spreads typically work better in lower volatility um, in terms of the risk versus reward and credit spreads, similar situation. Now on credit spreads, unlike debit spreads, you want the spread to be completely out of the money going into expiration for the pro full profit potential. This is because the spread that you're receiving comes in as an overall net credit, right? So you want that credit to remain in your account so the way for that credit to remain in your account is if those strikes end up expiring worthless, right? So if they expire worthless, that means that you receive the full credit, you'll get that back into your account, and then that capital that was also tied up within the risk is also recycled into your account, and then you can go on to a new trade, right? So credit spreads, they do well, of course, in a trending market, right? If you're getting in at resistance or you're jumping in at support, credit spreads are a great uh, strategy to look at whenever you're at those levels. But the benefit of credit spreads is they are also great on a consolidating chart setup as long as the spread remains out of the money. So if we're having a really choppy market, credit spreads can still benefit you beautifully whereas debit spreads might have a harder time working out because you need the spread to go into money. Credit spreads, even if the market's choppy, they still benefit you if they expire out of the money. So they work a little bit better in those kind of charts. So let's go ahead and pull up the main chart here so we can kind of just talk about this a little bit more, right? And Sean, so technically, you would have to be concerned a bit more about assignment if the spread ends up partially in the money. And of course, SPX in general is a cash settled index. So I wouldn't even worry about it on that. But let's say it's something like Apple, right? Let's say we're in an Apple trade. Well, then Apple, yes, you do have that risk of assignment. And so what you would need to be worried about with Apple, let me just pull this up on my option chain as well and bring it over is if the spread is partially in the money. 
Because if it's partially in the money, that means the one strike isn't offsetting the other going into expiration. So that's when you have the risk of assignment. But if both of my strikes are in the money, typically I personally will still look to close out of the trade because I just, you know, much like you're mentioning, I just don't even want to consider that risk on the table. But let's say you forgot about it or it just, you know, you know, you, you, you were doing something with the kids or something, or you were going out, you're at work, maybe you had an emergency and you just forgot this trade was on, but you knew it was in the money. So if it's completely in the money like this, the one strike will end up offsetting the other. So the brokerage platform will see this and they'll usually say, okay, technically they would get assigned, but they have the short strike here. The two will cancel out and we'll give her that profit for the canceling out of each other, right? Because the value of this spread going into expiration would be $5. So let's say we paid 230 on the trade itself, right? A 230 cost basis. So going into expiration, if this expired completely in the money, that means you'd have about a 270 profit potential. Now, as I mentioned for myself, I would 100% look to close this out, even if it was at 495, just to recycle it back in, right? Unless it's SPX where I know 100% it's cash settled, then typically I will still look to close it out. Um, but, you know, I've had it happen where it's like, oh, dang, forgot I had that trade on. Thankfully, you know, it's either completely in the money or out of the money. If it's completely out of the money, it expires worthless. You don't have any risk of assignment there. If it's completely in the money, then the one strike offsets the other. So that is... Um, how that would work. So in that case, right, this would be a long debit vertical spread really quickly. So let's say we think Apple's going to go back up to 260 to retest these highs. Um, well, then the 250, 255 might be a good trade, but notice the cost basis here, right? We're about $2 in the money. So what, what, there's some intrinsic value here, definitely. But I would say typically, if we were to look at opening this trade back when the market was like this, this spread here would be a lot less. I'd probably peg it for around 250 of the cost basis, even risk first reward on a five point spread. Because we are slightly in the money, we do need to keep that in mind. But right now, it's worth about 278, 280. And the reason for that is because there's more premium within these strikes due to the volatility. So it's costing us just a little bit more to get at the money. At the same time, right, the reason why I still like debit spreads is because when you have higher volatility, until you start to get a market day like this where the range shrinks, it shrinks, which means the volatility is going to start dropping. Even if you are seeing a strong move up, if you have ranges like this where you typically don't see that within a normal market year, you can get out of the money for still that decent risk versus reward because there's a better probability with that volatility that spread will end up moving in the money. So if you still want to keep a lower risk first reward, it just might mean that you have to move slightly out of the money. And the only time that's going to hurt you is actually whenever we're seeing a day like today. Let's say we're going into the close of market and our range stayed around $4.26 on Apple. Well, just last week, we were seeing $12, $15 ranges up to $20 ranges on Apple during this volatility. So to see a $4 range again means that we do not have any volatility happening here. And all of that premium that was built into that uncertainty on these option strikes is now getting sucked out. So that in the money premium that's there is getting sucked out. And more importantly, that out of the money premium, because all of these technically would be worthless if today was expiration and this is where we closed, right? All of these would be worthless. So that out of the money premium that's really built up into these strikes due to the volatility is also getting sucked out. Now, for a credit spread though, right? That's a great thing. So if we did an at the money credit spread, five points, now that's because this strike is basically at the money here. So we'll go with this one. You can see, no, I'm a little surprised. I would have thought this would have had a bit better credit, um, but still around a $2 credit, $3 risk here. So if we start to see that, and it could be because the volatility is starting to drop off some here. But if we do continue to see that volatility dropped off, and let's say we are right at the money going into close of this, then you're going to see all this de premium decay away, and it will end up locking in as a profit, right? The risk on a credit spread is if 
Apple started to turn back down in this case, right? Let's say we actually went back down to 244 to test the 10 period simple S support. Well, all of a sudden this spread would be in the money, right? And you can see how all of a sudden that value increased because it's holding now some intrinsic value on the spread, which is not what we want for a credit spread. We want it to expire worthless. So that is the cause there. Now, if we just stayed choppy, let's say we never got up to 260, but we remained, you know, above 250 this whole time. That's why a credit spread is still beneficial because you don't need much market movement. You don't necessarily need it to move up in your favor to work out for a profit. As long as these strikes expire out of the money, all this premium will be locked into your account. Whereas if we did the long debit vertical spread, right? Here, we would actually have a slight loss. Now, the benefit of starting slightly in the money is that there's some intrinsic value in the spread. So if you start to see some consolidation, it hopefully won't be a full loss, right? As long as part of your spread stays in the money. But let's say this was something like SPX where it cash settled right at expiration. Well, if we cash settled at 240 in the money and we're in the trade at 280, that's still going to be a 40 cent loss on our trade, right? So debit spreads, you need the movement of the underlying price for it to work in your favor more effectively than a credit spread, where technically you don't need any movement. And as long as the strike is out of the money, you receive that profit. And on Tastyworks here, a great way to just determine risk versus reward per contract is looking right up here, right? Max profit, it tells me, is $92 because I'm only looking at one contract. My max risk, because the spread width is 2.5, is at 158. So if I wanted to add contracts into that five, now it tells me, tells me the total profit potential for the contract amount, which is 475 here, total risk around six, 790 right? Depending on the fill, of course. Yes, a uh, guru. So for the overnight profit strategy class, as a bonus to that class, you actually got the ultimate guide to vertical trades. And so in there um, will be a much more extensive class going over vertical trades it will show potential examples kind of what we're doing now in the option chain and everything else um it was a pre-recorded class i did but let me see if i can't pull that up here just to show you what that looks like really quickly so if you go to your class section you go to the overnight profit strategy class right at the top here you can see the bonus class ultimate guide to vertical spreads and this is a, this shows you, um, you know, really intro information on the put and call, everything like that, how it builds into vertical spreads itself. And then, of course, as I kind of mentioned earlier in here, it also talks about what they can build into, right? So this is why I like vertical spreads also and why I think it's very important to learn them because they can be a stepping stone into other strategies, kind of what we talked about yesterday, right? Iron condors are a combination of two vertical credit spreads. When we looked at butterflies, right? A butterfly is one long debit put vertical spread and a short vertical credit spread. An unbalanced fly, typically the ones that we do here at Simpler Trading, has an extra credit spread to it. So you can see how knowing just what a long debit vertical spread and what a short vertical credit spread is can really build your knowledge and your toolbox into other option strategies that might benefit you in your trading. Yeah, so um, just to reiterate, so to make a vertical spread, whether it's a credit or debit spread, you need to keep the same expiration, right? So you didn't see me going out to different expirations because that starts to, you know, either create a calendar or diagonal kind of trade. So you want to keep them the same expiration. And then, of course, you buy to open the one that is at or in the money compared to selling to open the next strike. And that is a debit spread. And you can see here it automatically sets it up as a debit when you put the two in the same order ticket. Or if you're looking at a credit spread, right, then you're selling to open the one that is at or closest to being in the money 
compared to the one that you're buying to open. That will create a credit. And as you can see here, once again, it sets it up naturally as a net credit. So that way you know that when you're opening the trade, you're getting it for a premium. And most brokerage platforms will automatically do that, right? As soon as you put in the two strikes within the same expiration that you're looking for, same, you know, a certain spread width here, it will automatically show you if you have it kind of set up to be, okay, yes, this is a net credit naturally. So you're looking at a credit spread or yes, okay, this is a natural net debit that I'm looking at. It's a debit spread. Now, keep in mind, of course, right, when you're closing a debit spread, you're going to sell to close it for a credit. When you get out of a credit spread, you're going to buy to close the spread. So you're doing it for a debit. So kind of what we talked about with unbalanced flies, the one thing in particular that you need to be cautious about with credit spreads is technically speaking, when we're closing it out, we have to buy to close out the spread. So with credit spreads in particular, you don't want to be at a zero cash buying power if you're looking to close it out because you technically need cash buying power in order to make the closing order and pay the net debit. Now, it technically won't cost you any capital because once you pay the net debit, the risk that is tied up within the spread itself will be released back into your account as well. So let's say we are in this trade for $1.75 and we are looking to close it at a dollar, right? So if we are looking to close it at a dollar and this was the credit spread we are in, that means we're buying to close this strike and we're selling to close this strike. So once again, your closing order will be set up as a net debit to make sure it's a closing order. Of course, choose the strikes that you hold. And then over here in the corner, um, similar situation with thinkorswim, it will say buy to close, sell to close, right? It will be a C instead of an O. So we are buying to close the spread and let's say we're buying to close it for a dollar. Yes, we're taking roughly a 75 cent profit here, right? But we still need the dollar premium per contract in order to execute the order itself. And once it's executed, all this extra risk that's out here, right? All this extra risk that's tied up within this five point spread that will be recycled back into your account. And then of course that will end up bringing back your cash buying power to the upside. On debit spreads, you're closing it out for a net credit. So it's all a capital positive move that you're taking into your account. Here, you technically need the cash buying power to close it out. And then once it's closed and you know the order settles itself, that cash buying power will immediately go back up in your account because the risk on the spread itself will have been released. And yeah, Lee, there are different ways to trade vertical spreads. Absolutely. So um, Lee mentioned that John recommends choosing strikes based on delta, sell at the point two, buy at the point six five. Absolutely, you can look at doing that, right? Um, so yeah, you could do that. For myself, I like a better risk versus reward. And maybe John's using different spread widths, you know, or maybe he wants more of that guarantee, which is absolutely fine. Um, but those are just rules of thumb, right? You have to do what you think is best for your account. For myself personally, I like looking at debit spreads at or slightly out of the money. I like them slightly in the money with the long vertical because it does add that intrinsic value to the spread. So let's say it takes a while to go to the upside. Well, then I know there's still some intrinsic value in the spread itself. So it shouldn't hopefully be a full loss unless it reverses on me. Um, in this market, for example, in the overnight profit strategy, I don't even mind going slightly out of the money with my debit vertical spread because the volatility is there to where I know it could go in the money easily and it keeps my risk lower versus my reward. And then of course, on credit spreads, right? If I'm sure of a move that's going to happen, you might actually start slightly in the money. If you really think Apple, for example, is gonna go above 260, Sometimes you start in the money, you receive a better credit, you have a lower risk, and then that move occurs. And between going into expiration and the theta decay that starts to occur once it's out of the money, you lock in a profit. Other times, you know, you might start further out of the money just to have a bit more insurance that, okay, if I think 244 is support, well, I'm giving myself a buffer zone here. I'll take the 115 credit. Yes, it's less of a profit potential, it's a bit more risk but maybe it has a better likelihood of following through. And absolutely they get filled. Lee, it all just depends on the liquidity within the option strikes and usually within the symbol itself. So Apple, 
you're not usually going to have a problem getting filled out here. And I always, on any spread, guys, I personally, I always start at the mark, and then I work the order in five cent increments down to, you know, a level of risk versus reward that still makes sense for me. So always start at the mark. Try and get that favorable fill. Don't naturally go at the bid and ask. You know, I know John sometimes does that too, which you can. Um, but for me, if I can get a better price at the here, absolutely, I'm going to do that. Now, if it's a trade I really want to jump into, then if I don't get filled immediately, I'm immediately working the order to get filled. But if I can still not get filled at, you know, the highest cost, or in this case, the lowest credit, I'm going to look for that, right? So uh, always look at starting at the mark is what I would say. Um, and then work the order from there, especially if it's one you really want to jump into. Otherwise, you might just let it be there and say, ah, I like this trade. If I get in for this credit, great. If I don't, then I'm not going to worry about it sort of thing. That is certainly a viable way to trade as well. So um, hopefully that gives you a bit more information. Um, so like I said, you can certainly go off deltas. I know Bruce uses his deltas a lot. John does. Um, but those are just a rule of thumb, especially for maybe if you're a newer trader. Otherwise, you know, you'll start to see what works for your trading style and what doesn't. And personally for myself, like I mentioned, um, typically in a normal market, I'll look at slightly going in the money for long debit vertical spreads. And for credit spreads, I usually like to start right at the money. Because right at the money means I'm at least out of the money technically with my short strike. But being close to that level also means I'm getting a pretty good premium versus the risk. So it usually makes for a better risk versus reward. Now for myself also, whenever I usually look at credit spreads, I usually lo am looking at opening them right at support or right at resistance. So that short strike is in line with that level and that gives me that probability of it not moving above or below it. And in turn, gives me the probability of my spread expiring out of the money for that profit. So hopefully that was covered everything. Guys, I don't see any more questions. So um, that to me is the starter into all spread trading, right? If you have a good understanding of vertical spreads, then it's easy from there to go into a bit more complex strategies, if you will, like iron flies, iron condors, butterflies, things like that. So if you have a good knowledge of this, it's easy to build off of. Really quickly, I know it's technically the end of time here, but let's just go over the market really quick, see what it's doing today. So SPX, right? It's a very muted range for SPX as well. We saw kind of a higher open, right? Compared to the close, we closed around 25.39. We opened today around 25.60 bounced up within that first 10 minutes, wasn't able to hold it, dropped back down. Um, but it looks like we found support around 25.45 and then bounced and are moving higher. The caution I have here right now is that on the five minute chart, we're running into the ATR trailing stop as resistance and it's holding. Also notice how Bollinger Bands are starting to come together. So that's a slight sign of consolidation. Technically, all three of our time frames here are in a stacked up formation. The 10 period simple, which is the short dotted line, is above the 30 and both are above the 100. Here on the 10 minute chart, the 10 period simple has just rolled up off the 30. Both are above the 100. And on the hourly chart, the 30 period simple has just crossed above the 100 and the 10 is above both of them. Now, once again, much like the five minute chart, the hourly chart is showing some signs of consolidation with the Bollinger Bands. So that makes me a little cautious. Momentum's also resetting. We also have a choppiness on our breakout signal. So maybe today is a day where we don't see much range overall. Maybe we're actually starting to get back to a bit more of a normal trading range here in this market, allowing that volatility to at least reset back down some. That wouldn't be too surprising. Um, I will note on the 10 minute chart, we still have bullish signs with the momentum building up like this above the zero line and the breakout signals being to the upside. The five minute chart is more in line with the hourly showing that consolidation on the momentum and the compound breakout tool. So for those of y'all who like to intraday trade in these markets, first of all, on a day like this, when we have a much smaller trading range compared to what we've seen the past several weeks, first of all, if you're doing this week's expiration or today's expiration on SPX, for example, please be very cautious if you're starting off with a long strike, especially if it is out of the money. 
The reason why is you can already see here, the cost on these strikes has already gone down significantly because there hasn't been much premium. Earlier this morning, I think out of the money this far was about over $20 in value. And now it's about 14. And that's because the smaller range that we get, the less likely that this strike will all of a sudden go in the money. And if it's less likely to go in the money, and because it's today's expiration, all that extrinsic value is going to start coming out of that strikes, right? Or all of these strikes. So for the profit recycling strategy in particular, what I would recommend doing in this market, if you still want to stick with something like SPX, or, you know, certainly just anything in general, um, if it's having a smaller range today, keep in mind, this is something you can look at doing, right? If you're not going in the money to where it already holds intrinsic value, look at starting with a debit spread and then going into a vertical spread, or I mean, going into a butterfly, excuse me, to locking your profit. The reason why I would start with a vertical is because if you still anticipate, let's say SPX is gonna move to the downside and we'll go to 25.50 by close, then the spread could still go in the money. But while you're waiting for that move to occur, let's say you're waiting for the signal to follow through, the short strike will help offset the theta decay on the long strike. So it still might lose some value, but it will not lose as much value as if you just go with the long strike by itself, especially if it takes maybe an hour for that move to occur. So that's my two cents today on the intraday style trading. Um, otherwise, you know, if you do start with a long strike, just look at covering soon. If one, the price goes against you or, and, you know, of course, protecting your capital is what I mean there. Or two, if we start to see consolidation, right? So here, for example, if I was looking at a run up and then we got here, we dropped and then we're just barely bouncing back up. By this point, I probably would have looked to protect a rising bias trade if I was in one because we're having a hard time getting above this level and we are getting signs of consolidation. When I compare that with today's overall range on SPX, which has been a lot smaller than what we've seen the past few weeks. I mean, and this is so far, right? This could easily change by the end of the day. But right now our range on SPX is only $48.20. Right. Last week, we we're seeing ranges of one hundred and eighty six dollars. So a 40 point range is pretty good in a normal market, but it is very small in this market. So you want to be cautious of that theta decay. Uh, Nicholas is asking, what do you do when you have a debit vertical and the stock price goes past your short strike? Does that mean in the money? Because that's what you want. Nicholas, if that's what you're saying. So let's say um, in this case, because the market's trying to go higher. So let's say we think that the price is going to go back up to 25.95, right? The highs of the other day. So let's say I jump into the 25.95, 2600 here. It's a 220 cost basis. Now let's say we get up to 2600 and all of a sudden the spread is in the money. Well, this happens right now, right? I go from a 220 cost basis to a 270. So you can see how it increased in value. So on a debit spread, that's exactly what you want. You want the price to go in the money of your short strike because what that means is that your spread itself is gaining an intrinsic value. And because your profit potential is the difference of the spread width here, right? So we got in for 220 on a five point spread. So five point spread. We got in for 220 cost basis. That means our profit potential is 280. If this spread completely expires in the money going into expiration, that means 280 is our profit potential locked in, especially on something like SPX where it cash settles, right? You can even let it be partially in the money and not have to worry about assignment here. Um, but either way, in this case, right, if it completely goes in the money, you're looking closer to that max profit potential. And of course, if you decided to day trade this, or let's say you had opened it the other day and it was in the money now, then you can close it out for not the max profit potential. As long as you're closing it out for greater than 220, which is your cost basis, you're walking away with a profit and bringing that, that remaining 220 capital back into your account. So if we close at 280, for example, we're closing for a net. So your order would actually look like this now, right? because you're selling to close the strike that you bought to open, you're buying to close the strike that you sold to open, you're closing out of the trade for a 280 credit, you were in the trade originally for a 220 debit, 
So that means you're walking away with a 60 cent profit. So all that 220 capital is brought back into your account on top of 60 cents per contract here. If it's a credit spread, that's the opposite of what you want, right? So if you start it with a credit spread and all of a sudden this starts to go in the money, just like the debit spread, because it's in the money, it's gaining intrinsic value. But on a credit spread, because the credit we received is our profit potential, we want that to expire worthless. So that is the opposite of what you would want for a credit spread. You want the credit spread to stay out of the money. You want the debit spread to go in the money. Yeah, of course. Um, it depends on what chart you're basing it off of, JD, as well as your um, strategy, right? So I actually jumped into a long debit put vertical spread back here the other day because we were making a bearish divergent bar right near resistance. Now, instead, the market has decided to move higher. Typically, I allow for three trading days for this to work out on a daily chart. So today is the last day to see if we might not drop down and get a low, which right now it's not looking like it, but I'll probably hold this into close. Um, because I wanted to give this three days, I actually went out a little bit further in time than sometimes I normally do on the strategy. I went out to Wednesday's expiration. But you can see here that spread compared to where I opened it well out of the money. Now, because of the volatility, notice how it's still worth something. If this was a normal market, the spread would be like worthless right now with it being so far out of the money. So, and yeah, Taz, I agree. I think there is a psychological level that we're playing here around 2600. And certainly on a longer time frame, I'm gonna have to step off in a second to go into the main room, guys. But really quickly, on a longer time frame, this is really the level I'm watching into the close of this month. So I'm sticking more more with intraday style trades right now um, until we get into, closer into the close of the month to figure out longer term bias trades, unless I see something like the overnight profit strategy where you know I'm willing to jump into the signal. Um, for longer term trades, whether they're bullish or bearish, this is the signal I'm waiting to see. And this level is at 26.78, and I think maybe some change, but roughly 26.78. If the price can close the month above that level, then it could very well be like a December 2018, where we went down, we intraday, well, intraday, during the month, right? During the intra bar of that month, we traded below support, but then still held it into the close of the month and actually bounced up, went into higher highs overall. So if we see that and we hold into April at support level, I'm probably actually going to look at going back bullish again in this market. Now, would I had loved to take in the buying opportunity down here? Absolutely. But at that time, right, we were definitely breaking support. And for me, that was just not what I would do because if we break support and we close the month below 2678, then that's a very strong probability we're going into a bear market. Uh, the last two times we've done that in 20 years was back during the dot-com bubble into the early 2000s and during the housing recession back in 2008. And because of that, right, whenever we break that level, doesn't mean from the peak of this down move, just whenever we break the ATR trailing stop itself, the move to the downside roughly lasts about a year, give or take a few months. Now, because this has been such a volatile move, maybe it lasts less time. But if it breaks, I'm still anticipating a move lower in the market. So that is what I'm really keeping a close eye on for longer time frame trades. And the end of the month is during this week, right? We'll know by Wednesday. Tomorrow's close, really, we'll know, are we breaking this level or are we holding it? And if we hold it, I'm still going to be cautious. I'm still going to look through April. Um, but if April looks like it's also holding it, much like it did back in January of 2019 where we started to bounce, yeah, I'm all about going long again. Um, or, you know, at least up into resistance levels. I'll still probably be a little cautious, but I would look to go to the long side. If we do not hold this level, though, and it turns into resistance like it currently is printing now, then I'm going to look back to the downside. So... I don't know if I have any trades I would get into right now. I wouldn't jump into this one here just because it expires so soon. I mean, you maybe do it as a lot of trade, but right now the intraday charts are trying to go back up, right? We just broke five minute resistance. 2,600 is definitely my next target to the upside. If we start to break above that, um, then 2,615, the highs that we had Friday, followed by 2,636, 2640. 
um, to 2650, I would say, would be the next highs. And that's very close to that 2678 level. So we'll see what happens. But thank you guys for joining me today. Have a great trading day. And if I don't talk to you in the main room, I will definitely talk to you all again tomorrow. Bye. Without simpler trading, I could not have financial independence. This is one of the best investments I ever made in my life. It's helping me find consistency. It's one of the things that won me over.